So uh, welcome friends to this episode of the Bakhtes Histories of uh, Cyprus. The Bakhtes is an independent public history project. Each month our editors bring fresh and exciting work from all around the world uh, on the history, the people, the culture of, um, of Cyprus. If you would like to support our work, you can uh, or join our team. We're always on the lookout for new collaborators. Uh, you can access our website at historiesofbachjes.org or find us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we invite you to share your questions, comments, concerns throughout uh, the duration of the episode using the uh, chat function. We remind you to be uh, respectful of others in the room. Uh, and without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to our host for this afternoon, uh, Nur Chetinar. Nur. Thank you, Loizos. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bachi's History of Cyprus. Uh, my name is Nur Chetinar, uh, and today I'm joined by Andrika Svarnova, who is a professor in British Imperial and Colonial History at Flinders University and honorary professor at the Montfort University. He has written and lectured on British and European history with special attention paid to both British and Ottoman empires and their influence on the Middle East. Uh, and Varnova has published several papers, monographs, edited volumes and chapters. He is one of the leading historians on the history of Cyprus during the British colonial period. Uh, his research generally falls under the umbrella of history of colonialism, war and migration. Uh, today we are not going to talk about mig migration, but maybe I hope we will talk about it in another webinar. Uh, and today we are going to talk about Cypriots uh, under the British administration, uh, and we will focus on the people of the islands, the, uh, people of the island, and their lives, their identity construction process. And first of all, I would like to thank Andrea Svarnova very much for attending our webinar all the way from Australia, despite the time differences. So uh, and let me uh, let me also thank you. Thank you also for having me. It's uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Varnova. Uh, hi and welcome to you. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, as I said, we will focus on the Cypriots. But before uh, passing uh, to Cypriots, I will uh, first I will ask the uh, classical question <laughs> to you. Can you elaborate the importance of Cyprus for the British colonial administration or was the islands important for the British? Well, when they occupied Cyprus way back in 1878, they had hoped that it would be important to them. They had particularly hoped that it would be strategically important. They had hoped that they would um, have a, ga a large garrison in the island and they hoped that they would have a naval base and their plan was that in the event of let's say troubles once again between Russia and the Ottoman Empire that they could use their troops from Cyprus to quickly go and help the Ottomans which they had actually undertaken to do in the agreements that had seen the Ottoman Empire the Sultan uh, cede the right to occupy and administer Cyprus to the British. Um, however, Cyprus very quickly, as soon as they got there, to them was, was pretty bad. I mean, there were no roads, there was stifling heat. They began to uh, become quite unwell, the troops. We know next to nothing about the Indian troops that were there. This was the first time that Indian troops, or let's say troops from the subcontinent, had been taken to Europe. Um, they were in Cyprus. We, we don't know a great deal about them, but we do know that the British troops suffered from malaria and other ailments. Um, and there were many other reasons why they, they realized that maybe this wasn't such a good decision. After all, they hadn't done a great deal of research. Nobody had visited there to give an assessment of the island. The harbor was, they had planned, they had hoped that Famagusta Harbor would be their naval base, but it was in no state to be a naval base. Uh, it was clogged up full of sand. Um, there were many, many sort of, you know, many, many reasons why they very quickly just began to pull away from what they had thought Cyprus would be, even to the point where they 
announced early in 1879 that they wouldn't go ahead with um, redeveloping Farm Augusta Harbour, um, even though they did have <clears throat> a study done on it and, and it wouldn't have cost a great deal as a first step at least to, to dredge the harbour and, and do some minor works there as a first step. But they decided that instead that they wouldn't give, they wouldn't provide any imperial funds to redevelop Cyprus. Uh, during the next period, of course, the Beaconsfield government falls in 1880, and then the Gladstone government comes to power, transfers Cyprus from the Foreign Office's responsibility to the Colonial Office, and thereafter Cyprus more or less is treated like any other colony, even though it still was, um, sovereignty still was with the Ottoman Empire uh, until 1914. And thereafter, Cyprus, basically, they use local funds primarily for works. Um, they, they develop, for example, a little bit Larnaca, a little bit Limassol Harbour, harbours, Kerinya Harbour. Uh, they built excellent road infrastructure. That was probably their, their most significant um, public works that they did. Um, during this early period. And then um, when Joseph Chamberlain becomes colonial secretary in the mid 1890s, that's when there is some investment. However, it was a loan. It wasn't merely given over. They had, the Cypriots had to repay that loan. And that's, the, that's when Farm Augusta Harbour was redeveloped. However, it sort of goes back to the first study of 1878-79, it was really just an initial first step. It wasn't a naval base when they redeveloped it. Uh, it was basically for it to become a, a small, really, commercial harbour. And they also built reservo reservoirs at that time um, and also the train. Um, and yeah, the, the importance of Cyprus was really, as I say, in, in, in my first book, which was which was a an adaptation, if you like, of my PhD, British Imperialism in Cyprus. Uh, I call it the inconsequential possession. I mean, it's important to note here that the vast majority of the British Empire, you know, was not India. It wasn't the jewel in the crown. I mean, they were by and large. It was by and large these places were inconsequential. Um, we can talk about other places. That obviously, this isn't the place to do that. But yeah, it was just another part of the British Empire. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, what was the reaction of the islanders to the new rule? For, for example, in the classical histori historiography, uh, many works defend that Archbishop Sorafinos welcomed the British with the desire of enosis. But uh, you show that it's not valid. And, uh, can you explain this? What did the Archbishop expect from the new rule? Okay, yeah. Well, basically, let me just say that I want to pay tribute here to Rolando Scaccionis because uh, he actually, uh, before me, he showed that Sophronius never said anything in, anything in support of Enosis when the, Archbishop, when, uh, the British arrived. Um, and one of the pieces of evidence that Rolandos used, which I think is a very important piece of evidence, were, were the criticisms of yeah, Cypriots who had uh, settled in Egypt. And they had someone uh, in Cyprus who was uh, there at the arrival of the British. And he then was very critical of the fact that nobody stated at the to the British that you know Cypriots want to unite with Greece. So that was a very telling piece of evidence that Rolandos put forward. I merely built upon that by finding and it, it wasn't actually somebody told me where this was and it was uh, I'm happy to say Rita Severis told me where the speech was that Sophronius gave to Sir Garner Worsley upon his arrival. Um, from memory in some obscure uh, archive in Canada. Um, so the speech itself was in French. Um, 
the language, I suppose, of diplomacy. And, and Sophronius was an educated um, archbishop. He, he'd been educated both in the Ottoman Empire and in Greece, obviously in theology. Um, he'd become archbishop in 1865. So he was archbishop for 35 years. And as you say, there is this myth of the welcome. Uh, what's interesting, however, is at some point in time, so that the myth of Sophronius' welcome is the original sort of myth. Uh, early on in the early, very early 1900s, soon after he dies in, in 1900. So he was Archbishop for 35 years. We then begin with the Sophronius myth that he said all of this. Of course, he's dead now, so he can't, he can't rise up and say, ah, guys, I never said this, right? Um, and here's my speech. I, you know, he probably gave it to some British guy, and that's how it ended up in Canada. But he never said anything of the sort. His, his primary... Uh, expectation or, or um, not demand, but sort of expectation was that the British would bring equality before the law um, because uh, of the of the inequal, unequal nature of that uh, institution or the judiciary in in Ottoman times. That was his sort of main expectation, and that they would improve the economic situation as well. Okay, thank you. And speaking of Archbishop Sorokinos, can you talk a little bit about him? You have an excellent book chapter, and you describe him as the last of the old and the first of the new. Can you elaborate yeah. on You're referring to the book chapter in this book, which I did yeah. with Michalis, uh, Mikhail from the University of Cyprus. He's in the Turkish Studies Department. Unusual, but I might just read the last paragraph here because it sort of speaks to what you said and I can't probably say it any better than what I said here. Um, Sophronius was undoubtedly the last of the old ethnarchs and the first of the new. He was the last of the old because he wanted to continue the practice of church co-option by the state as practiced under the Ottomans, which had given the church a privileged political and socio-economic position. Now by that, I should stop and explain that under the Ottomans, the church was incredibly powerful. It, it begins really in the 18th century and, 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 and possibly even before then, but, but you know, there's very limited work on the 17th century. Uh, but from the 18th century, we begin to see this. Were, the, the archbishops were, were so powerful, they could remove a governor if, if it, they could, if it all aligned right, they could. Um, and before the events of 1821, uh, it happened several times. Often they would, um, you know, side with the government against the peasant population, which consisted of both Muslims and Christians. Um, of course, we have 1821. I I've just written a chapter about 1821 in a, in a new book. You probably can see it here, this one. Um, with Yanni Cartledge on, which elaborates further from my, from this book, from my, where I talk about those events and how um, basically, how basically the um, executions that took place were in large part um, a, a result of the fact that the Archbishop I hear much. Oh, it's okay. Am I back? Yes. So yeah, what I was saying is that the, the new chapter in this book builds upon this, this early sort of snippet in that, going back to that book from 2009, in which I say that the executions in 1821 were, uh, at least in some part, a result of uh, a governor who was uh, upset at the power of the archbishop and the bishops in the island. And Sophronius basically wanted to continue that relationship, the role that the church had as part of the administration. And, and repeatedly, for many years, in fact, would go back to this, to the British, um, and one of his main complaints was that the 
church could no longer collect canonical Jews, you know, funds that they were, had been allowed to collect under the Ottomans. And he would refer to the Barat that he had, that he had the authority to do it, but he couldn't do it anymore. So that's what I mean when I say the privileged position and co-option. He was also the last of the old because he did not believe in ethnic nationalism or specifically Greek nationalism, or indeed in Enosis, unless the British were to abandon the island. So whenever later on, not during the early years, um, but later on, when there were, for example, rumors that the British would abandon the island because they were going to reduce the size of the garrison, um, the, the, you know, there were rumors spreading that they would leave the island um, and Sophronius uh, under pressure, presumably as well, although I don't know that for sure, but, but he, he wrote and he said, you know, if you are going to abandon the island, we'd, we'd like us uh, to be uh, united to Greece. Um, but uh, he made it clear that he said, if you're going to abandon the island. Um, now, he was the first of the new because he saw the church as a modernizing agent urging the British to introduce equality in the judicial system and supporting representative institutions and mass education. Yet he wasn't modern enough. And this is one of the points that I make in that chapter uh, um, that you referred to, because he's, he's a neglected figure. Uh, because at some point in time, this myth changes to, it wasn't Sophronius who said it, but it, it had been the Bishop of Gideon who had said it because they worked out that he was the one who was the nationalistic one out of the two. So Sophronius, even though he's archbishop for 35 years, is, is a rather forgotten figure uh, in Cyprus. Um, but I, I felt, I, I, I worked a lot on Sophronius, that he was a far more complicated ethnarch um, that, that gave me uh, you know, how can I put it, not inspiration so much, but the interest to keep going in and trying to understand him. I think one thing I forgot to mention was this letter he sends to the Jerusalem Theological School, where he says, um, my country is Cyprus, and I'm an Orthodox Christian of the Eastern dogma. Um, it's quite a telling thing. I think he always remained with that idea, with that view, this, if you like, Romeo Sini uh, idea, and just couldn't understand nationalism. He, he, he definitely, in his early years, definitely in the 1870s um, and early 80s, he's, he, he's thinking that this is contrary to Christianity, even, um, which is where I, I think it must have been in here as well, where I talk about it in that chapter. Okay. Uh, but you mentioned that he wasn't a nationalist, uh, but um, uh, why did he chose Greece instead of Ottoman? If the British left from the island, uh, he chose uh, Enosis. Uh, why he didn't uh, want to go back to the Ottoman? Because he had a powerful position during the Ottoman era. Yes, that, that is true. Um, that's a question that I... Um, I I wondered, but I, I, I suppose I didn't fully contemplate. I think it's primarily because of the fact that by the time that he's saying um, that he's come, come to that view, he is trying to allow, he's thinking that Cyprus should, because of the majority Christian population, be joined to Greece if the British leave. So he's, he's Preferences for the British to stay, uh, even though they haven't co-opted the church, and he's upset about that. Um, but he he also has fallen out of favor with the Ottomans. Now, at in the eighteen, I'm trying to think now. In the eighteen seventies, I think in eighteen seventy two, maybe, or eighteen seventy one, he went to. Constantinople to Istanbul on a on a mission, and and he 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 achieved I think what his the intention was to help um, relieve the situation in Cyprus, but at some point when the ecumenical patriarch is becomes vacant, his name is put forward as a candidate, 
I've never been able to properly investigate this, but I do know that Sophronius's name was, was removed, so to speak, by the Ottoman authorities. So, so something has also happened there, and, and he's probably picked up on that, um, that he, did, he had lost favor um, with the Ottoman authorities. And he, he definitely welcomed the British in 1878. Um, he did believe that the British would bring, so to speak, and, and being very generalistic, better times. Um, you see in the images um, that the, they're welcomed, you know, with the raising of the British flag in front of the cathedral there. They've even put the, you know, in the front cover of the book, right? They've yes. even put... They've even put the throne that's inside, that's usually reserved for an archbishop or a bishop, outside for the British to sit on. Of course, they don't sit on it, but that's beside the point. They've gone out of their way to, to, to create this elaborate um, ceremony in which they're blessing the British flag. Um, yeah, it, there's more to be, there's probably more to be done about Sophronius and what happened and his name was struck from the potential list of ecumenical patriarch candidates. Okay, thank you. And so after the death of Sorofinos, the struggle between nationalists and conservatives began for electing the new archbishop. What was the role of ordinary Cypriots in this struggle? Or did ordinary Cypriots play a role in the struggle between the nationalists and the conservatives? Well, they, they did to some extent. Um, and I think Rebecca Bryant has written about um, some, of, some of this. Um, um, basically, as you know, there is a division between the, those supporting the Bishop of Gerinja who to some extent, although that does change, um, supporting the old Sophronius line, but I think it's sort of changed to, you know, soft enosis, so to speak. Enosis, when, when the British want to give it to us. Um, and the Kitiaki, who are far more fanatical, far more nationalistic, far more eager to see Cyprus un united to Greece. And to some extent, in order, you know, their, their authority to, rests upon the legislative council. Um, and so they want to be there in the council to put forward this, um, these, the, the idea of enosis. So, people voting for them becomes important, but also they need people to be going around and, 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 and you know, telling the British whenever there's an opportunity. So often uh, during this period, but also after this period, up until the First World War, you know, when British officials, High Commissioner or someone else, was visiting a town and they had given notice that they would be visiting the town, oh, the Greek flags would come out and all of that would happen. And, but there's also evidence that when the Gov High Commissioner would deviate from his program and went to another place, there'd be nothing there. There'd be no Greek flags there. There'd be no reception and speech about, you know, enosis or anything like that. So there, there was this element that of the British believing that it was, uh, that it was to some extent manufactured or artificial or con uh, controlled by those who believed it was in their interest to support and prosecute the idea of enosis. Okay, um, I am also wondering about the influence of newspapers on the island. Right after the British came uh, to the island, the first newspaper was uh, established by the Greek Cypriot Tedos Constantinides. Uh, what was the importance of newspapers in spreading national ideas? Did uh, newspapers have any significance? significance for the lives of ordinary Cypriots? Well, as time went on, it certainly did. Um, in the, however, even up till World War I, uh, a substantial proportion of the population was illiterate. Um, obviously, they would still be able to uh, appreciate what was in the newspapers if they'd gone down to the coffee house and 
there were inevitably there'd be the teacher there or someone there who who could read to them uh, what was in the newspapers and probably would would read it out loud out aloud. Um, in the early years, I'm not I'm not so sure about um, how strong the influence of the newspapers would have been, um, but it's they're, they're certainly uh, around. Um, they're sort of a bit up and down, you know. Newspapers start up and then they shut down, and then they start others start uh, start up. So there's a little bit of turnover during those early years, um, but we do begin to see more consistency at sort of the turn of the century, and and by that point in time, we do begin to see a greater. I think that they're starting to have some some influence. Um, However, we also need to remember that, you know, if we think of Surridge's report from, you know, 1930, based upon, uh, you know, his investigations in the, in the late 20s, and, and Surridge had been in Cyprus since World War I. So when I did the other book on the muleteers, he came up and I, and I saw, his, saw his name and I thought, ah, he's been there for a while. So when he comes to do that report, he's, he's already quite knowledgeable about Cyprus, but but the telling, what, some of the telling things that he says, um, and one of them that I remember very clearly is that 80% of the population was either on or below the subsist subsistence line, which is telling you something, that their priority is to actually feed their families, feed themselves and their families. So I think that even up until the 20s, the vast majority of the population are peasants and really the, you know, small holders. They don't own a lot of land. And that's their priority. Um. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think to that... some extent their, their world was was separate from the world of the of the politicians to some extent. That they they're connected in some ways, particularly because many of the politicians were money lenders um, and so forth and so on. However, there is at the end of the day the, this class differences still around, certainly during the interwar years. Yes. Uh, so when we came to the First World War, <laughs> uh, yes. both uh, Christian Cypriots and Muslim Cypriots joined the war uh, as militaries in the British yes. Army. And Christian Cypriots joined the British Army before Greece entered the war. And Muslim Cypriots joined against the Ottoman Empire. How can we explain their situation? Why the ordinary people of Cyprus, both Christian and Muslim, joined the war together? Well, the, the, the fundamental main reason why they joined was because it was a good way. It was a good wage. And the British... In, from around 1912, 1913, we begin to see Cypriots migrating. You said we wouldn't talk about migration, but a little bit we will, because uh, they begin to migrate and um, we, they begin to go to North America, South America. And the honest truth is, even though I've done a little bit of work on this, I, I, the, the, there is a lot more that needs to be done, but I just don't have the files to know what numbers are we talking about. Um, in 1914, we also see, or in 1915 and, and into 1916, uh, Cypriots uh, being hired to go and, and go to France for good money as well. Now, obviously, Cypriots also migrate um, to Egypt, that st still remains a very popular destination. And there's a lot of what we might call seasonal migration there, where you know they go there to work for, I don't know, however many months of the year. It depends on how much work they could find. It depends on the year, if it's a good year for work. Um, and people going back and forth. So what the British do when they're asked to form the uh, new corps, the governor, Sir John Clawson, says, "Well, we've got to we've got to stop migration. Otherwise, we're not going to raise anybody. We're not, nobody's going to want to be part of this mule corps, no matter how much money we offer them." So that's what they do. They they basically ban uh, men of military age, of, of military age from leaving the country, and therefore, well, there really is. Uh, only one alternative or two alternatives. You stay in the island and, and, and you hope for the best or you sign up. And the, th the point to say is that, you know, I, I think um, 
you know, at, there were about 12,000 or whatever it was that signed up. So this is the book um, which, I, which I thoroughly enjoyed doing. If I can just say for a minute, the plan was to do this one first. This book was, I was meant to do this book first. Uh, but, but then one of the, what was going to be just one chapter in that book, and it was one chapter in the, it, when I did the book eventually, but ended up turning into this book, uh, which um, was a little bit of a miracle book because there, there was just so little information. But I found the list, the honor roll, um, incomplete as it was, uh, but it was enough, more than enough for me to be able to piece together what had trans, as well as other sources. Um, and the honor roll is what shows me that they signed up together because they're, what happened was the British set up centers where they had to go and uh, go forward and sign up. And, and I should point out that many more were rejected than accepted. Right, the British didn't just accept everybody. Um, although there were instances where they accepted people, and then they found out that they had some disability or whatever it might have been, and and they ended up sending them back. But but that was that was sort of rare. It wasn't that common. But these centres, um, you know, you had to travel in some instances very very long way to to get there. So not only what, did it make sense to go together um, for economic reasons, um, it, made, it, it made sense to them because most of these people from mixed villages, and there were many, many hundreds of mixed villages uh, at this point in time, they were friends. They were around the same age, right? When, when, when they went together to sign up. Yeah, of course. Um, oh, yes, you asked me about Greece. I forgot. Yeah, sorry. You asked me about um, how they enlisted and they went to, to Gre um, in the Greek army, did you say? And also how the Cypriot Muslims fought, fought against the Ottomans. Yeah, yes. Well, let's, let's clarify. None of these muleteers fought, right? They were auxiliaries. They were there to carry food, to carry ammunition, to carry the wounded, to carry the, the dead if they wanted to carry the dead, if they could. Um, they weren't there to fight. They weren't armed. Uh, they, yeah. So they were there to, so to speak, drive the mules. Um, and, and basically that, that was all that they were meant to do. I mean, uh, of course, it's quite interesting that, that, so they served in Salonika primarily, um, and basically what they did was um, the Cypriot Mule Corps wasn't sort of this unit or basically Cypriots were taken and added to various um, units and whatever regiments, battalions, whatever it was. So some of them, you know, unusually, though, ended up in other places like in Egypt, where there, there, there is um, definitely uh, one case where, which I talk about in the book because he lost the lost the leg there. Um, but also, as you know, when, when you know, the Salonika front uh, ended, uh, let's put it in, let's put it that way, uh, they went to Istanbul as part of the allied armies of occupation, you know, so, and yes, there were Muslims, Cypriot Muslims there in, in, as part of that. Um, at that point in time, of course, the Ottoman government was cooperating with the allies. Um, so in that instance, it didn't seem all that, I suppose, unusual. So this is this was normal for uh, the people at that time, because uh, we are living in a nationalist world and national states and the Christian Greeks and Muslim Turks in the same arm sound interesting to many people. Yeah. Orthodox Greeks uh, joined the Anglican British Army. Yes, they uh, were both Christian, but their sex, sects are uh, were different. And uh, Muslim Turks joined the Christian Army with Christian Greeks against uh, Muslim uh, Ottomans. Uh, was it uh, interesting at that time too, or it's, uh, it was normal for them? That's a really good question. I mean, 
I'm not sure if it was normal in a in a broader context, but for the people themselves, I think it was just another job. Um, and to be working with, you know, Cypriots working on on whatever jobs, that was totally normal for them to be working together. Uh, it would have been totally normal for them to be employed, uh, you know, in the redevelopment of the Famagusta Harbour or in the construction of the railway or in the construction of roads or, or, or uh, the reservoirs or whatever it might have been. And I, I, I don't think that any of them would have considered this um, as, as unusual um, in that sense. Now, for us and for other, I suppose, at the time, Europeans, they might have, you know, if they'd known about it, um, <laughs> thought of the political connotations of it, but I don't think these people thought too hard about the fact that they were uh, fighting, or not fighting, contributing towards the British war effort. Um, certainly if they were, certainly in my view, if they were opposed if, to the British war effort, if they were on the German side, they, they, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have uh, signed up. Um, as we know, um, you know, I, I, I did an article some years ago, which I updated uh, for this book on British uh, military intelligence in Cyprus. And as we know that, you know, there were a handful, a handful of Muslims who were, who were disloyal. I, I think it's fair to say, however, the majority of the population, both um, Christian and Muslim were loyal to the British empire. There's no doubt that some of the politicians were, 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 not, were not loyal, but they weren't dangerous, if, if you know what I mean. There was just, you know, chatter. It was just sort of all talk, really. Um, the, 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 the Cypriot, um, Greek Cypriots, they, they, from what I can see, there wasn't anything um, treacherous, I, I think is the word that I want to use. Um, there might have been some, you know, trade with the enemy, right? But... The one, the big one was when um, this Muslim, this Cypriot, um, Turkish Cypriot took a, took a small vessel down in, down to the, I think it was Adana, and basically told them everything about the, what, what the British were doing in Cyprus, where they, where they had their bases, the, everything to the, from the Cypriot mule corps to the fact that there was the Legion d'Orient, the Armenian Legion, um, up near uh, Monarca, near Bogazi, there, everything spilled the whole beans. Um, yeah, but by that point in time, I think it was later on in the war, the Ottomans were 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 unable to capitalize on, on this. Around and and you know they flew over these places which this guy had described to them. Um, and this was revealed much later, interestingly, by a witness who was there. Uh, he worked for, I can't remember who it was, and he ended up in Cyprus and he revealed this information to, to the British. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The other, the other one was the article that I wrote in which I talk about Cypriots serving in the Greek armed forces. I really enjoyed doing that article. Um, it was very, it was quite difficult to do because you're arguing against the grain, against what people believe, which is that Cypriots flocked to the Greek armed forces. Well, they really didn't. And they avoided doing so, even if they were, uh, even if they had gone and taken out Greek citizenship as well, there was an avoidance of doing that. And then there was the instances of Cypriots in Egypt and elsewhere who were suddenly and rather randomly kidnapped by the Greek authorities to go serve in the Asia Minor Anatolian campaign. It was extraordinary information. Um, yeah. yeah okay. You also mentioned uh, Cypriots were kidnapped uh, by the Ottomans, right? Yes, earlier, earlier on, yes. They were mainly earlier on during the war, I think. Mm. It was a very similar sort of situation. Mm. Some uh, Turkish Muslim Cypriots also didn't want to enter uh, the Ottoman. Yeah. Mm. yeah, most of the most of these people who were kidnapped were just going about their lives in wherever they were, 
you know, they were there working. Some had, many of them had families. And then suddenly they're, they're taken off to the front. It's like, well, no, you know, I'm just an ordinary person living here. Um, and I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm not connected to this war, basically, is, is what they what they were trying to put across, but it didn't work. And these are the only, uh, these are the cases that we know of only because they were able to get to a British consul, right? I can't even imagine uh, how many others there were. Obviously there were Cypriots who uh, willingly volunteered and went and fought. We know that there was um, a, a small amount that went and fought in the Balkan Wars. Uh, as well, um, but yes, that the numbers are really by comparison to how many went to serve in the British forces, they're they're quite small. But on the other hand, we also need to consider that they're actually fighting uh, in the Greek armed forces. They were not auxiliaries, whereas on in the British uh, armed forces, they were they were auxiliaries, and in the uh, advertising. For recruitment, the British um, made it try to make it very clear that they would not be in harm's way, which you know, if an educated person were to see that, they would uh, you know they would think twice about whether that could be possible. Uh, there were many who died. Um, many of the Cypriot muleteers did did die. Um, but yes, basically, we need to understand that distinction. Um, but yes, we, 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 there, there wouldn't have been a great many uh, Cypriots who served in the Asia Minor War who left, who went from Cyprus deliberately to serve, partly because the British didn't, didn't allow it. Mm. Okay, so it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you mentioned briefly the loyalty of the Cypriots. Um, Uh, can you explain this? Uh, because uh, you uh, divided the islanders into upper, upper class, middle class, and uh, lower classes in your book. Uh, can you elaborate on the relations of Christian, Muslim, Christian and Muslim Cypriots of different classes with the British administration? Yeah. Well, in the, I mean, going back to the early days of, of, of the British occupation, The class distinctions are, of course, um, more, more larger, more evident. Um, we see um, very clearly, even during Ottoman times, Christian and Muslim peasants uniting together against the administration. Uh, uh, we occasionally see this in, in the early years of the British period as well. Um, but, but as we get to World War I, um, we begin to see the, 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 this breaking down a little bit. Um, yet there are still, um, a, you know, the population at primarily are peasants. Uh, and Surridge's report is, is one source that we have that shows us this, but there's, there's of course, many others. Um, and of course, we see the, so, you know, middle, And, and upper middle classes, their, their world basically revolves around either <clears throat> trade, sometimes both trade and politics. And, and their politics during this period is, is somewhat disconnected from the peasantry uh, because it re really revolves around either supporting Enosis, either In a, in a sort of fanatical way or whether or in a more moderate way or in the Muslim case it's to oppose it and and you know you sometimes get people saying oh well no look the Cypriot the Turkish Cypriots they weren't opposed they even signed on the uh, during the referendum uh, you know after the Second World War well you know we have all of the evidence Got dating back at least till you know before the world first world war of opposition to enosis from Turkish Cypriots and indeed from the from the other from from minorities from the smaller minorities Maronites and 
uh, Latin, Latin Christians and, and, and Armenians, particularly during the interwar period. So I think that the class distinctions are still there. And I think that the nationalism, although it has, um, it has evolved, it, it hasn't totally, totally sort of penetrated the entire population and that there are still people whose primary identification is a religious one during the interwar period. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, I have one last question. <laughs> so uh, we talk about many things uh, about nationalism. It's uh, spreading in the island. Uh, um, how do you think it's spread across the island? Do you think uh, any other alternative uh, po uh, possibilities? Um, uh, do you think any other alternative was possible? Uh, I mean, um, the, the Greek speaking Christian people have to be Greek and the Turkish speaking Muslim people to be Turkish. It was it inevitable for them? Well, I think in history, nothing's, no, nothing's really inevitable. Um, the spread of nationalism was, was, didn't happen overnight, nor did it happen in a week or a month or a year. It happened over um, a series of decades and perhaps several generations as it um, you know, spread um, you know, during World War II and, and after World War II. Um, so it was, a, it was a, certainly a very slow um, process. Now, could there have been an alternative? Um, there, there, it's hard to say that's, that's um, a hypothetical. Um, thinking about my the the last book that I did, uh, which is this one, I, don't, uh, I, I I went in for some hypothetical in this one, in which I I hypothesized that, for instance, and and I'll come back to your question, but I hypothesized, for instance, that so the book is about the assassination of Antonio Sirandafilidis in January of 1934. And, and basically, he was assassinated because he believed that the, the, the only way to achieve Enosis was through cooperation with the British. Maybe that goes back to the Sophronius you know, line. However, um, the fanatics believed, were totally opposed to, to anything other than Enosis. And by this point in time, the idea of independence had, had also come up. Uh, it had, in fact, come up as early as 1912, at least that I can see, possibly even earlier. So for them, independence was totally anathema, was no. And they believed that uh, anything other than Enosis risked bringing potentially independence. However, if they had, if let's say Grandad Felidis had not been assassinated, could it potentially, could, and he had succeeded in redeveloping, so to speak, relations with the British and cultivating along the lines of, the, of, of what we might call the Malta strategy, <clears throat> could it have worked in a different way? Could we have seen Cyprus become independent without having to have gone through a very traumatic and violent period from you know, April of 1955. Um, maybe. And maybe if that had occurred, that the Cypriots, like the Maltese, might have, so to speak, abandoned their, in the Maltese case, pro-Italian identity. Um, Obviously, it's a little more complicated in Cyprus with the two religious groups, but the, you know it's a hypothetical. But you never know; it might have it might have happened. I mean, there are many people now who believe that they are just Cypriots, and it doesn't matter what their what, what their religion is or what the their religion of their parents is or what their language is. So I don't know. The answer is I really don't know, but maybe. Okay, uh, 
thank you very much again. It's almost one hour and it's yes, time to uh, pass the Q&A se session. Uh, this was such an interesting conversation to me. I enjoyed a lot and I hope it was the same for you and the audience. Uh, and the, now you, you can ask the audience, you can ask the, their questions to the Professor Varnava. Uh, you can raise your hands or just write them the, the message box and uh, I can read. Uh, so, uh, Aliosha. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Varnava. That was great. Um, so you talked a lot, I think very rightly, you said that even up until the 1920s, about 80% of people were at or below subsistence level. They were mostly illiterate. And you painted a picture of separation between the like middle class realm of politics and ordinary people who are concerned primarily with the living wage, whose motivations are therefore pragmatic, um, whether it's joining the Mule Corps or supporting certain political movements, they're um, really concerned with um, managing a livelihood for themselves and their families. So as a consequence of that, I, I think I think if I heard you right, you were also suggesting that nationalism is a primarily middle class, and this tracks with a lot of historians' ideas that nationalism is a, essentially a um, phenomenon of uh, literate people who are, get educated, maybe go to Greece or go to Germany or something, learn of this movement, and then um, spread it through um, the, the population. I wanted to ask if um, you would, if maybe you could share your thoughts on, on whether nationalism should be identified just as kind of a phenomenon of middle-class politics that's separate from a from a from from some other activity of, of the working class, or if there might be some more organic, let's say, connection with the working class. So I guess a different way of, of asking this is, as a historian looking at the history of Cyprus up, up until the 60s, as the last question indicated, we could tell the story of politics and nationalism as something imposed from above on a population that itself is not um, really uh, thinking that much about politics. Personally, yeah. I, I feel like that might that might leave out some or, or might not fully account for um, the kinds of politics that we see. So yeah, if you can just respond to that. Yes. Well, I agree entirely with what you say. Um, it, it doesn't, it does leave out. Um, particularly if we if we think about how many people from the peasant classes around the time of the First World War and indeed after aspire to no longer be part of the peasant class and therefore um, you know make make steps let's say in their lives uh, to you know, work in a different uh, area, so to speak. Some of them migrate, um, and that's part of this. Others migrate internally, and internal migration in Cyprus had been happening uh, under the British, um, but especially happens when the redevelopment of you know Farmagusta Harbour happens when the Railroad, railroad is built and so forth and so on. And that's when we begin to see, for example, the, the growth in, in, with the population in uh, Varosha, Varosi. And um, so we, be, we do begin to see people of the peasant class moving um, their social, you know, they're, they're socially mobile to some extent. Um, you know, entering, let's say, the, the sort of more lower middle class. And they're and inevitably coming into contact with the, those who are more politically involved. And that transfers to them to, at, at, at some stage in this relationship. So I think this is beginning to happen by World War I. Um, and then after World War I with things like, you know, the Russian Revolution, um, as well as the rise of fascism, by the 30s, we're beginning to see um, peasants who have already um, moved into, you know, become socially mobile, 
um, they are now also, you know, identifying more and more as Greeks or as Turks, whether they're right wing or whether they're left wing. Now, I know that the, the Communist Party of Cyprus with the very unfortunate KKK uh, acronym, you know, was, was in favor of independence for Cyprus within a Balkan federation. Um, but by the late, well, actually, I think it's earlier, but let's just argue, let's just say here, by the late 30s, there are many left-wing Cypriots who are uh, more in favor of NOCs than independence. Um, and that's where we get, I think that's where we get Agel um, during the Second World War. So, yeah, I would agree with what, you're, what, you, what you just said. However, again, this is, I would say, a smaller proportion of the population than, than you know, the majority. That's why by, you know, in, in 29 or whenever Surridge has done that report, he's saying that 80% are on the subsistence line or below it. It would have been more, it would have been higher 15 years earlier. Great. So, so just to follow up. So insofar as nationalism becomes a popular movement, so at some point it does gain support beyond just the middle class, it's a byproduct of social mobility in your yeah. view. Thank you. I think that answers it. Thank you. And um, Alexia. Yes, hi. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm not sure about my connection. Okay. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for a very, very interesting talk. Um, my question is uh, a bit similar to the one that's in the chat right now. So th there's this historical classification of Greek Christians versus Turkish Muslims that continues to this day. Um, but I was wondering about the people who did not fit these rigid categories. How were they represented in all of this? Uh, or were they represented at all? And also the second question would be how was the colonial administration stance towards them. Are you? Do you mean other? Do you mean minority groups? Minority groups, and also I don't know if it's possible to be Greek and Muslim as as opposed to Greek Christian, and also yes, any other minority groups as well. Yeah, sure. Well, absolutely, all of that applies. I mean, um, obviously there are small groups of um, Maronite Christians, Latin Catholic Christians, um, who are descendants of various Western European and indeed Levantine um, communities, whether they're French or Italian, going back, um, Maltese as well. And then of course, there are um, many so-called, as they were called, uh, Lino Bambagi, Lino Codens, people who were to the outside world um, Muslims and privately Christians. I think not a, not a great deal of work has been done on this, but my feeling is that um, from, from the work that has been done and from my assessment, that it's, it's quite more complicated than that. Um, and there is a lot of crossover between their religious practices. And in, in many instances, they developed sort of their own uh, identity, um, not simply saying, you know, to the outside world, they were Muslims and privately they were Christians. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, you know, for the, from the British point of view, you know, one of the things that the British wanted as soon as they got there was a census. You know, and the reason why they wanted a census is because they wanted taxes, right? Um, however, those census reports contain, you know, from 1881 and, and roughly 10 years, uh, there are, every 10 years thereafter, although, of course, it's interrupted during World War II uh, and delayed until 46. Um, but those census reports count, you know, the population. And um, you, you can find some... Uh, unusual things there, um, things like Muslims who speak Greek, Christians who speak uh, 
primarily Turk, uh, Turkish and so forth and so on, you know, these combinations. Um, in terms of how the British, um, I think you asked how the British um, responded to them or how they included them. I mean, when the British established the Legislative Council in 1882, they distinctly did not refer to, well, they gave, first of all, they gave the locals, the Cypriots, a majority in the legislature, which was which was quite ahead of its time, actually. Um, and they didn't say, you know, there will be so many Greeks and so many Turks or, or so many Greek Christians and so many Turkish Muslims. They, they, it was specifically along religious lines, Christians and, and Muslims. They referred to it in the old style, Mohammedan. And, you know, to the extent that in the interwar period, when, when the Greek Cypriot nationalists boycotted the elections in, in early 20s, I can't remember the exact year, uh, a group, uh, you know, I think it was two Maronites put, Put their names forward, and and um, this up, this ended up upsetting the Greek uh, nationalists who wanted to have it both ways. You know, they didn't want to run, but then didn't want anybody else to run either. Um, but I think that from the British point of view, they they respected the the minorities in the sense that they respected their positions, particularly on on Enosis and how they genuinely believed that it, it, it could potentially threaten. Uh, their existence uh, in Cyprus, and if not their existence, their economic interests. This is super interesting. Thanks. Um, would I you happen to? Uh, I was wondering if you have where, where I can read more about this census um, writing. The census. Who has? Yeah. If there are any. Um, well, I, I, I've written about the census mm -hmm. reports in 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 you know my in more not in all my books in the three books that I did. Uh, the three main books. This is just really a booklet, really. But anyway, um, in the other books, they all have introductions where I talk about the census because I find the census very important. Even though it, even though it's not accurate, um, it's as accurate as what we what we're going to get. That's what we basically pretty much got, and we can you know cross reference it with other sources. But you know we can see there, you know, um, in more recent times as I've started you know working on migration. I can see, you know, how many, for example, white Russians were in Cyprus, right? Um, or how many people were not born in Cyprus who claim who belong to the Greek Cypriot community or whatever, you know, um, or, or how many people were born here or there. So, you know, the, the census reports are, some of them are available online. You can find them, um, particularly the older ones, I think. Um, but yeah, my, my books give an analysis um, of, of them. Perfect, thank you. There is also similar question uh, in chat box by uh, Christos Nicola. Um, do we have any sources on the status positions of the island's religious minorities to towards the British administration, or if they also had shifts in their identities due to the growth of the middle classes on the island? Wow, that's a really interesting question. So when I worked on the minorities, it was uh, quite a long time ago, uh, back when I was living in Cyprus and we organized the Minorities of Cyprus Conference. And I would argue that not a great deal of historical work has been done since then on, on the minorities. And indeed what we did was just a very how can I put it? Like a really, it was a first step. Um, I've lost. I've forgotten the question. Sorry about the. Uh, let me read again. Yes. Um, do I have any sources on the stances, of positions of the island's religious minorities to, towards the British administration, or yeah. if they also had shifts in their identities due to the growth yeah. of the middle classes on yeah. the island? Well. Their position about on the British was that they wanted the British to stay. Their position was, you know, we are a minority and the British are our best bet of protecting us. Now, whether that was because they feared um, for their 
existence and their identities if Cyprus joined Greece, or whether it was because for economic reasons they believed they believe that the British were a far better prospect than a poor, very poor Greece, particularly during the interwar period, and, and you know, an unstable Greece as well. So they were very firm about being opposed to Enosis, um, absolutely. Now, as for their identity, that, that's a harder one. That's a very hard one to, to answer. Um, but the best way to answer it is that I think that these groups uh, are able to remain distinct primarily because of their religious affiliation. However, it becomes very hard as, as small because they are small and particularly because there is a, an element of intermarriage occurring. And inevitably, when you're intermarrying into a much larger community in a place like Cyprus, you end up uh, to some extent being consumed by that larger identity, which, which is everywhere, is around you, right? Um, so I think that it, it's basically, that's how I would answer that. Okay, thank you. And uh, Zelia. You are mute. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, Yasu. Yasu, how are Andrea, you? How are you? Are you um, well? I'm not a historian. I'm a historian philosophy and come from a decolonial uh, perspective. So um, my first question is about the discussion of, I mean, the following up of um, Gachaunis. Um, the important and, and and I also consider very important um, that the, uh, different genealogy he does of the you know when the British first came to the island and he debunks. I mean he um, I mean um, um, he deconstructs that uh, myth. Okay, but on the other hand, one might say that at the level of narrative, what he Actually, he doesn't do it, but uh, embracing the other narrative might also have the power of a myth. That the British came and everybody wanted them because they believed in the rule of law. So I, I, yeah. I, the way I approach Kachaunis intervention in the, is the archive is to observe that um, nationalism was, and um, Cypriot Greek nationalism was actually stronger in the diaspora, for example, the uh, diaspora in Egypt than in Cyprus. And I find it interesting how um, uh, nationalist ideology can be re-imported from the margins. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in, in a similar way, we, we, there is a, this myth that uh, the British tried to anglicize the education. Yeah. Which is yeah. a myth. They, they never tried yeah. to anglicize education. and. Uh, but at this, and at the same time, uh, I I have a letter from the Archbishop writing somewhere at the turn of the century, saying that complaining why the British have um, uh, fired the the Anglo didascalos, the teacher was teaching yes. English at Pankipio Gimnasio. Um, yes. This also though doesn't mean that uh, English. And the teaching of English didn't have an imperial uh, power in Cyprus, particularly with uh, regards to the blackmailing of the um, of the people working in the civil service who were expected within two months of English to um, to pass the exam. Otherwise, they would be fired. So that uh, that English had. Uh, a power as a discourse. Um, my, so uh, my other question is about the use of the term ordinary Cypriot. Mm. Um, I understand the power of the term, but I think it misses some of the agonistic power of the term subalter. Yes. For example, um, because um, the term ordinary Cypriots is not ideologically neutral. It had already been used by the British to um, 
refer to the good Cypriots, the natives, the ones who are not, uh, uh, who don't have the disease of enosis. That is yes. the people who are apolitical, but yes. the ordinary people um, had also subaltern um, sides and interventions. For example, it's very interesting how in the 30s, um, uh, the youth became securitized with all those uh, laws that were introduced about um, juvenile delinquency and ordinary youth uh, who were uh, committing ordinary crimes, such as stealing lemons or yeah. riding a bicycle in the evening, ended up in the prison of Lambusa, which was actually a prison. So. Uh, these are my questions. Yeah. So your, your first question was about the Gachaunis and the transfer from Egypt of the, of the national. That was more of the observation. My question yeah. is whether yeah. I, I uh, whether um, uh, giving too much emphasis also to the real speech of Sophronios might yeah. also be building another kind of myth might be building another kind of, of myth. Um, the, the myth that, uh, to be yes. more uh, raw, that, uh, yeah. uh, so that the British were welcomed and the yes. British were good because they were bringing the rule of law. Yeah. Well, yes and no, because the British disappointed them and it didn't take very long for them to disappoint them. Um, however, just like when Cyprus was occupied and it was the talk of the town in the UK, particularly in London, you know, that it was going to be this and it was going to be that and it was going to be fantastic, um, you know, when or the British arrived. The, what they refer to as the white elephant. But, yeah, in the sense that it was, but, you know, very quickly they realised that it was, a, so to speak, a dud. Um, However, there's a similar thing happening the other way around, and, and that is that when the you know, the expectations of the Cypriots are to some extent unmet by the British arrival. Um, they, they, they are, it is met from one perspective of the, ju the judiciary does get sorted out. Um, <laughs> although when priests are, are arrested, they're not happy about that. So that, that's an interesting one. However, from an economic point of view, they're, they're not particularly satisfied that they, they, they expected more from the British. Um, but I think that that comes from in part a misunderstanding of the differences between the UK and, and, and the difference with its empire. Um, the, the empire was there to in large part serve the imperial center. And it was, you know, not intended for it to itself, for instance, become industrialized, right? Mm -hmm. It was there for raw materials um, and to facilitate trade uh, and to protect the empire as well. So it's not so much that there is a myth being created that's, uh, or a second myth being created. Uh, it's, I suppose, the context that I mean, Sophronius himself is perhaps a little more old than, than new. Um, however, he is uh, eventually rather disillusioned um, by the British. And I think that in part, this also helps, particularly after his death, the nationalists. Um, and also helps explain why the supporters of Sophronius have pretty much abandoned his line because um, they are now supporting Enosis. Even if they are more moderate than the others, they are still giving great, much greater emphasis than certainly Sophronius did. And your point about anglicization is a very important one. Um, in my first book, I talk about how the High Commissioner, can't remember the year, but it's early on, it's Sir Robert Biddulph, and 
and he wants to introduce English in the schools alongside the, <coughs> alongside the local languages. He doesn't want to replace them. He wants to introduce it alongside the languages. And it's rejected back in London by the Liberal government because they argue that, well, Greek is a European language and, and you know, they don't need to learn English in order to become in intelligent. So I think that was a substantial turning point and not something that was, it was revisited a few times later on, but, and they did teach English in some schools, of course, but it wasn't the same thing as what they were proposing at that moment. The, and your second um, question? If, if I just make comment on that. Um, yes. <clears throat> they didn't introduce English. They didn't introduce the teaching of English but they introduced a fear to the power of English, or yes. they introduced a fear to the lack of English. Yeah. So um, what, what during the later years, even after the independence came to be known as Kiverniticus Exedasis, the government exam, like if you pass this exam, then you have been saved, you will have a job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually the first government exam uh, took place in uh, in 1900s the the yeah. first uh, the first fall and it was introduced not as a language certification it was in, introduced as a, as a ritual of passage you have to yeah. obey you have to suffer and then you are one of you you become yeah, yeah. one of our subjects and I think this. The, 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 this imperialist approach to language, which is other than the English language, has in a way become coextensive to the teaching of language later on in Cyprus. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it also connects actually in the 30s to migration, when they, they introduce restrictions at the port of departure, in other words, in Cyprus, they introduce restrictions and you have to have this, you have to have that, you have to, and then one of the other things you have to have is a basic understanding and the ability to speak basic English before you can migrate. It, it, not so much for the for the women, because at some point in the late 30s, they they the British basically say we want more Cypriot women to come here uh, because the Cypriot men here are taking our women. So you know that discourse. However, for men, it becomes something that's necessary for them to, to have at least a basic level of English. Have you but written about that, this? Have you written about this? The, yes, that it was yeah, big final. yes, yes. Is, is this from the Australian archives in Melbourne or from? No, um... no, no, but the Australians also require it later on. Um, but. Um, it's, it's in the article in English Historical Review. I'm pretty sure we talk about it there. And there's several other pieces that I've done since then, which has added to it because I, I later discovered some other files Thank as well. Which, this is yeah. very crucial, um, yeah. in, in, I mean, intervention in the archive. Thank you. Yeah. Language becomes very important for, for, the, for the ability to migrate. And, and I mean, but this isn't unusual to Cyprus. The Maltese, they can't migrate unless basically they have a knowledge of, because they, they're primarily wanting to go to Australia and they can't really, they can't go unless their immigration department back in Valletta ensures that their English is up to scratch. So it's happening, not just in, in the Cypriot context. Have I answered? I can't remember your second question. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. I don't want to take over, just to share with you this anecdotal little thing. Yes. My mother, um, her, her brother's, migrated to Australia, both in right. the thirties. And she was the youngest of the family. So she remembered when she went to school and they started teaching them lessons in English. And then she, she teach, she's playing with my child, for example, she starts saying one, two, three, four, and then she doesn't know the next. And then she starts, yeah. oh, damn them. And I say, yeah. I mean, tus kataramenus. And I'm saying, who yeah. mom, who were the bad ones? She said, and they were teaching us English, and those older boys in the village, they were parading for Eoka, and they destroyed our English books, and they also yeah. broke uh, broke the marks that they gave us 
for yes. the celebration of the Queen's uh, birthday. And she says, that's the only mug ever anyone gave me in my life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Zelia, for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. It's precious. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from uh, unnamed <laughs> Zoom user. Uh, you are Mut, do you want to ask the question or? Maybe they're she on, or they're they're they mistakenly raised uh, his or her hand. Uh, I think we don't have any question. Uh, yes, right. Uh, so uh, could, I, could, I, I could I follow up on something Zelia just said? If we have like a couple. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things I took from I don't know if this was the question that you wanted to ask Zelia, but was um, um, earlier when we talked about the myth, we talked about the myth of welcoming the British that might be problematic. The so so there's a myth of um, desiring enosis. And I understand that your work works against that, right? And we talked about, okay. No, 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 I'm, I'm hold on, not hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm, okay. No, no, hold on. That's not my point. So the one problematic myth that we could advance would be being in favor of the British doing it. Another myth we could advance, and this relates to my earlier question, is that the ordinary people don't have a position on, on NLC, so might not. So you can say, oh, look, we want, the ordinary people want NLC, so that's the problematic nationalist myth that, kind of conscripts the people into a political narrative. And then there's another myth saying, oh, maybe they welcome the British because of modernization. There was a pragmatic view in front of it. And then there's another myth that we I, I, uh, that we could advance that uh, or the ordinary people don't have a political view. I don't know if, if maybe just say one more thing about that. For me, for me, that's, I think there's a truth to that. And that's, I think it's really important to, to highlight that the ordinary people are not automatically politically mobilized in service of something like NOCs. But I, 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 I thought Zelia, or I don't know what I heard or what I thought of when she was talking was that, okay, but we shouldn't then go and say that, oh, ordinary people are just ordinary, don't have politics. So when Zelia said, oh, look, the subaltern are more agonistic, for me, that's meant to highlight the fact that just because you don't have an opinion on NOCs doesn't mean you don't have a, a politics at all. Like they're not just an ordinary people that can be mobilized for the purposes of, you know, some bourgeois politics or whatever, there there is some some thoughtful politics there at all. So I, I guess yeah, just maybe if you have any any thoughts on that, like for me, that's yeah, that's just what I took away from Zelia. As a, as yeah, a, as a... I mean, it's it's very difficult to know what the peasant population, what the rural laboring population, you know, the majority of the people, you know. You know, felt and believed at, at, during either the early years or, or even later. Um, and the other thing to say is going back to something Zilia said about Subaltern, I mean, there is a significant power dimension here, right? Um, so, for instance, during World War I, when we see people writing to the government and saying, My son served in your glorious armies for, you know, liberty and so forth and so on. To what, I mean, you know, I sat back and thought this is rather elevated language from some guy from some obscure village or, or maybe not from an obscure village. It doesn't really matter. But, you know, to what extent is, is this a reflection of their view that they are so much lower than the British? Do you know what I mean? In this power dynamic that they need to uh, elevate and exaggerate the language or, or, or are they do they genuinely believe in this? I mean... In, in some instances, I wondered. Um, so even going back to the late 1880s, there was, this is something that I've, there's a couple of things from this period that I, that I want to revisit one day. Um, and what, one of them is, is the famine in the Garpas Peninsula. And the other one is the legislative council elections. Can't remember the year, 1887 maybe. Um, in which a district commissioner whose name was, I think his name was Young, but I've forgotten his first name, decided to run. He was the commissioner of Paphos. No, Farmer Gusta. Ah, before he went to Paphos, probably. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. He, he was, you know, they moved around. And he was, at the time, he was the district commissioner of Farm Augusta. And he ran to be elected in the legislature and he missed out. And he appealed this, claiming that those who had won had bribed their way to victory. And there was a court case, and I can't even remember what happened. However, what I do remember is that local people from Farmagusta district were brought in and testified to say that, yes, they were bribed, and yes, they wanted to vote for Young, but they didn't, and whatever, and so forth and so on. You know, it's a very tricky one in that case. You know, if they, if they swore an oath, hard to argue that they were, you know, that the power dynamic might have influenced them to testify in such a way in favor of the British, but it still may have, you know, I don't know. I, I need to revisit that. It's a huge, huge file, if my memory serves me right, which I never properly um, studied closely enough, but it's a very Thank interesting one. Can I say one thing? Because um, earlier you said also something along similar lines, I think. You said, um, when you were talking about nationalism and the peasants, you said something along the lines of them being non-nationalists, but they had religious identities. So religious yeah. identities preceding that. And the question of religion and politics, as you're describing it, and especially in this voting, is a question of like genuine or sincere belief. So you might have this, you know, the power that distorts some genuine belief in being Christian or Muslim or being pro this candidate or pro another candidate. And yeah. um, I guess my, my point would just be that I, I, I'm, I think, I'm, I'm, this is a broadly shared point, but searching for that genuine, sincere, like core belief that's masked by, uh, uh, dist or distorted by power dynamics might be a, you know, it might be a red herring. It might be, yeah, no, it might be. no genuine mess there. But the question, yeah. the question remained, but then we shouldn't, so then as a historian, do we just, but then do you just write the story of the, of the what appears as a you know whether it's distorted practices or politics or whatever yeah. what 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 can you account for if there's no genuine genuine yeah. there? which is all to say i share the problem the problem with yeah yeah i mean the critical thing is that i mean first thing to say is if i were to write this book now for this period it i wouldn't be writing it the same way i'd be writing it in a different way and and you know because i've been quite influenced by the muleteers book and you know then i went back and finished the other book because i said i was going to write it so i went back and wrote it but i feel that i wrote it in a in a sort of very similar way to how i wrote the first book right um and then i went off and did this little one which opened up again my eyes in a different way to actually really thoroughly reading against the grain these these archival sources um, even more thoroughly perhaps than I had in the past um, to the point where I make this argument that, you know, the people that were probably behind the assassination are the ones writing in the newspapers in Greece saying that it was not, a, not an assassination and it, it was a, a, a murder for, for uh, personal reasons and so forth. And, and I'm arguing, well, it's quite likely that they're, they want to present that uh, rather than that's the you know that that being the truth because they probably were behind it. So yeah. yeah. We have one more question in the chat box uh, from Christos Nicolaou. Uh, do we know what the relationship of Serafinos with his Muslim uh, counterparts in the Legislative Council was? Did, you, did he say Sophronius? Yes, Sophronius. Sophronius never sat in the Legislative Council. Um, he never sat in the Legislative Council. He considered it beneath him, I believe. This is my, I never, I don't have any documents to prove what I'm saying now, by the way. But I think he was, I think he considered it beneath him because he wanted the British to co-opt the church. He didn't want the church to be, to have, have to go to the legislative council others did others other bishops yes they did the nationalist ones particularly they went there they went they wanted to be elected but not sophronius sophronius again this is you know more of the old you know i suppose a bit of the old in him that you know 
as as ethnarch, he he didn't want to be put his name forward and run a campaign and so forth and so on to be elected when he already has, in his view at least, the ear of the high commissioner. Um, however, if we if going to your the substance of your question about his relationships with his counterparts, the relationship that he had with his counterparts was was actually really good. Going back not just to Ottoman times, but also to particularly the early British period, but also even later on in the uh, mid sort of to late 1890s, I'm just trying to think, there was a governor, there was a high commissioner called Walter Sendel. And I distinctly remember a file in which both, I'm pretty sure it's Sophronius, um, and the Mufti, I think, sign, as well as many other signatures from both Christians and Muslims, asking London to keep him on, to extend his time as High Commissioner. Uh, my view of Sophronius is that he did, did not um, favor Enosis, unless, as I said, the British left, because he did feel that it, it, it would have, it could have caused problems between the two communities. Um, just based upon the way he talks about being a Cypriot and Cyprus and how it, he, it's really fundamentally a, a, a religious identity and a very, space I, I driven I suppose identity you know the place um, that he called his homeland uh, okay thank you very much uh, I think we don't have any question uh, thank you very much for this stimulating presentation it was uh, wonderful for me and thank you very much for the uh, audience uh, you attending this uh, webinar and supporting budgets uh, and for the closure, uh, Loizos, would you like to take over? Sure, just a couple of uh, quick announcements before we go. Um, one thing is uh, our episodes are uploaded on our YouTube channel, uh, usually within the week, but we are experiencing a backlog right now. So uh, subscribe to our social media or uh, YouTube and uh, you'll be notified as soon as this uh, episode goes up if you wanna tell your friends and family. Uh, the second thing is, do we keep the conversation going uh, on our blog? So if you would like to contribute by writing a short reflection piece, maybe you were inspired, maybe you were uh, really happy about this, maybe you were angry, maybe uh, something came up that uh, um, made you want to look into it a little bit more, tell us about it on our blog. Uh, you can uh, uh, access our blog on our website. Uh, I'm uh, sending the, um, the link in the chat uh, right now. Uh, uh, or uh, talk to one of us uh, on our social media. Uh, the final thing is, if you've enjoyed this webinar, uh, this episode of the Bashar's Histories of Cyprus and would like to come back next month, our next guest will be ethnomusicologist Nicoletta Dimitriou talking about her new book on the Cypriot fiddler. That will be in February. We will announce the date on our social media. So Andriko, thank you so much. Noor, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you all next, uh, next month. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you.